Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Can you, can you see me or? No, not yet. Not yet. Okay, this is like a new phone, so I have to, I have to see how that works. Um, now it's better. Here we go. That's it. Hey, okay. How are you? Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. I'm fine. I'm fine. Yes. I'm fine. How are you? Are you in uh, England or? No, I'm not in England. I'm in Portugal. Portugal. Okay. I, I just figured you were one hour behind, so Portugal is nice. I was there in uh, February in Lisbon. Were you? Yeah, so, so I was meeting with a, with a judge. Uh, I have some colleagues in uh, in Portugal I'm discussing human rights issues with, so it's, uh, yeah. yeah, I've been there a few times. Right, Marius, are you all right to be recording already, or do you want me to, we just talk and then we start recording? Mm, whatever is suitable for you, it's fine with me. Okay, so then we can just already start recording because I think we'll... We will go with that. Right, so Marius, um, thank you so much for accepting this invitation to speak with me and, and taking time off your amazing time. That I'm sure that you have plenty of things to do and, yeah, um, right. and to discuss some ideas with me. So my name is Yolanda Menino and um, I get quite a few parents. I interview the parents, mothers and fathers or other people that they have a very vocal position about forced adoptions. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't know if you know anything about me, probably you don't. No. Not very much, no. Right, so, um, um, back in 2016, I was in England, and um, so I had lived in England for six, seven years, I went to there in 2010, and I was working, I was very well integrated, and uh, by the way, I was working in cardiology, so you know I was getting good money. I had my dreams, like professionally, and then I decided to get pregnant. Um, I never heard about forced adoption. I never heard that babies could go for adoption when they actually they have family, and little I know that I was going actually to experience that. So my own baby was taken by social services in Southampton with only five days old and you were sent for adoption. Right, eight years have been gone and I do not know anything about him and like I usually say, I don't even know the color of his own eyes. Because I'm Portuguese, I came to Portugal to ask for the Portugal support. I went on the news, I was everywhere on the news, I spoke personally with the president in Portugal, with the prime minister, with the, port with the president, I made sure that it was caught on camera and it was mm -hmm. actually on live TV. I spoke with the prime minister, prime minister personally, unfortunately that moment was not recorded. I spoke with the minister of foreign affairs, I spoke with MPs. I made sure to be the front cover of the most important magazine in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Even the name that I gave to my baby Santiago became the most used name in 2016. Became a popular name now in the Portuguese. Now Portugal knows about forced adoption. Now mm -hmm. the Portuguese, they know what social services they are doing. I encourage Portuguese mothers to speak, but unfortunately I didn't get my baby back. Now, what I know about you, like, I'll be honest, I do not know much, but I know that I must speak with you. I have seen your face several times associated with several cases, especially in Norway. I know that you are fighting for our human rights. Now I will let you present yourself, please, and share your information with us and what you have to say about this subject matter, please. Well, uh, yeah, happy to speak to you. It's, um, it's an honor to meet people around the world who are fighting uh, battles against human rights crimes. Um, actually, I spoke to uh, yesterday to a group of women in Ireland who are doing the same as you are fighting uh, the child protective service system in, in Ireland because they feel that there are many similarities between the Irish, English and Norwegian and Scandinavian system and I do think that um, like you are related to the English uh, or the British system 
Yeah, I've been doing this for so many years that um, I've been doing human rights law for more than 25 years now, so it's a long time. Um, And I have seen so many cases where the government is severely like interrupting into these families without any good reasons. And for me, this is, um, when we're talking about forced adoptions, of course, I've been dealing with a lot of Norwegian cases, but also on a worldwide issue. Um, I recently spoke to uh, organizations in, um, in South Korea, in Colombia, Sri Lanka, who have been dealing with the same. It's more of an international issue that you're actually stealing babies from um, from capable families and pretending that these uh, these children were orphans when they were taken. And when they grow up, they realize they've been living in a lie for so many years. So this is a worldwide issue. Um, definitely, we have succeeded to put focus on what's going on in Norway, um, since we have managed to make Norway being convicted in the European Court of Human Rights 37 times since September 2018. That's a massive number. Wow. So Norway has received 37 convictions since uh, September 2018 wow. that Norway has violated Article 8 of the Convention in breach of the family rights of these. So that proves that, and, and the system in Norway is very similar to England, but I think that so you can gain a lot of experience from uh, reviewing these judgments where Norway has been involved, where the European Court, which is applicable to Portugal and England as well, that uh, the government and the authorities have taken these children on the wrong basis. And that's, um, of course, that's one of the most serious issues we can talk about when it comes to human rights breaches, because you're actually taking children away from families without any probable reasonable cause. Um, so, of course, that should be something, and that I aspire and, and inspire all people from, uh, especially in Europe, to, to study these judgments because there is a lot of things you can benefit from, this, especially uh, parents who have been, uh, whose children have been taken into public care. Um, without there names, are a lot, and we there don't know are, anything uh, about them, you know. Yeah, so um, so that's something that, um, in a way, we have been successful in Norway to to at least to disclose how Norway has been violating the fundamental human rights into into family matters, and uh, I really hope that this can be something that other countries also can benefit from. You have your case, uh, of course. I'm not familiar with the with the details and the statement yeah. and the facts of your case, but I think that. Um, since the system in England is very similar to what it is in Norway, I think that it's very important if you want to continue to fight the government to, to study these uh, premises from these judgments and see if they can um, apply to, to, for instance, your case or to other, pe- other people who are fighting the system. Yeah. So basically, um, so what we're actually doing now is that even though we have been successful in um, having Norway convicted in the European court. The problem is that the government of Norway is not respecting these judgments. Okay. So the, so the parents who have been um, successful and have won in the European court, they have not been able to be reunited with their children. So the most famous case is the so-called Lobin case, which was the Grand Chamber case, the first Grand Chamber case ever to take place in a, in a CPS case. And that case, um, the, the judgment was revealed five years ago in the European Court by the Greek president by the, back then. And Norway was convicted, and we were confident that when Norway was convicted in the Grand Chamber, uh, the mother and the son would be reunited, uh, because that was also about forced adoption. Uh, five years later, nothing has really happened. Uh, which is, of course, very demotivating for for the people who are fighting for so long. Um, So so basically, um, as we're speaking now, I'm trying to put even more focus internationally that uh, Norway and other countries, like also England, even though they have been convicted in the courts, they do not respect this judgment. And that makes it, of course, even more difficult for the parents to... Uh, to successfully fight the government when the government actually ignores these judgments as well. So, 
I don't know. It's a it's a very and that that's why I was very happy to talk to this uh, group of people in Dublin yesterday to see if we can start more of a world alliance group. That they came up with that idea. I think it's a good idea. Of course, it's a. Uh, it's not easy to to uh, to establish such a group, but it's definitely in order to be more successful with this, in and in order to fight the government and the system more effectively, we have to we have to ally more. I think yeah. so. A broader consensus when it comes to like realizing that these battles that you are fighting, that Norwegian parents are fighting, or people even in New Zealand are fighting. They have the same, you know, basis, and yes. that is that the government. This is like, this is, these are like crimes against humanity worldwide, and and the reason why, is, at least in Norway, why this is such a broad issue to take children into public care is, of course, because it's a big, big business. Yes, it is. It's a huge business that generates billions, billions of euros per year, and a lot of people benefit from this business, like lawyers, social workers, judges. Uh, you name it. So, so this is like something that we have to put a broader consensus about worldwide. So um, that's why I'm happy to talk to you as well. That you're in Portugal, I'm in Norway now, and and to see that the, the the fight that you are fighting is very similar to what people in Norway are fighting, and even in New Zealand are fighting, or wherever it is, yeah. because it has a, like a yeah. it has it's a very systematic pattern here. Marius, would you mind me to ask you to Western European countries? Marius, would you mind me to ask you what's your background? What made you to be interested on this on this subject matter? How have you how have you heard about this? And uh, what made you become public about it, please? Well, first of all, I'm a, I'm a human right. I, I studied law 25 years ago and I specialized in human rights law. So my major and my degree is in human rights law. So it was natural for me when I started as a young uh, lawyer to to uh, to focus on human rights law. So are you a lawyer? Uh, hmm? Are you a lawyer? Yeah, I'm a human rights lawyer. Um, I was a lawyer in Norway until 2009 as well, but they took my license in Norway. Not surprising. Uh, that that was back in 2009 when I worked. I didn't work at that time. I didn't work with child welfare cases at all. Um, I worked with uh, very, you know, very high profile cases, but not with child welfare cases. Um, I think that was the reason why the government wanted to get rid of me as soon as possible, and uh, they tried, really tried. Um, so I but suppose I that to... did you try to bring back some children that they have been removed uh, from the families? Uh, not, not back then. I didn't start with child welfare cases before, really, before 2010, like 14 years ago. Then I, then some people approached me and asked me if I could look into some cases. And but back then I was, you know, I wasn't that much aware of the fact that this was like, uh, this was something very systematic. And uh, but I was looking into, let's say, 50 cases back then, and I realized that neither of these cases were scrutinized by the Human Rights Act, so they ignored. And that's the problem with a lot of these cases that the, the judges and the lawyers in Norway they ignore the human rights. So they basically are funding the uh, the principle about these cases based on the presumptions of the government's view. Um, then, of course, I decided because I kept my license uh, internationally to to bring some of these cases to the European Court of International Human Rights and. Uh, and uh, it took a few years before the European Court of Human Rights uh, were convinced that Norway was like a mass violator of these human rights. So, but in 2015, we had a major breakthrough. We got a lot of support from the international community. And, um, and from 2015 and onwards, we have seen like that Norway has been mass uh, convicted in the international tribunals because they have been systematically violated these these rights uh, for decades. Yeah. So it took it took a while to convince but um, but also that especially eastern european countries have been very 
active and uh, given very solid support uh, when it comes to like uh, bringing a focus on this. Because in Eastern Europe, you have a very different approach to these matters. Uh, there is a huge difference uh, with regard to family issues when you see it from the Eastern European side and the Western European side. So. Norway has been uh, troubling with uh, most of the Eastern European countries as well when it comes to these matters because the, the governments in Eastern Europe, let's say Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Bulgaria and so on, have approached Norway saying that these, uh, these children who have been taken into public care are um, would, would, that would never happen if, if these cases would occur in, in Eastern European countries. So you see like there is a mass. So Norway has been um, pretty much condemned by very many countries now in Europe. And uh, of course that's very satisfying to see that our point of view is, is the correct one with regard to the, to the, to the law. Uh, but the problem is of course that we are meeting mass, massive uh, resistance especially from the government because they claim that uh, and they ignore these judgments so basically that's why it's um, so when when back to your question I, i've been dealing with child welfare cases for the last 14 years but not all of my career so i remember back in 2016 2000 yeah 2016 i remember the american lady beautiful lady that had the beautiful baby boy, Amy, and had the baby Tyler. She was an American mm -hmm. citizen. I have, I have tried to dig into it. I've never heard more anything about them. Did she was able to get Tyler back? No, I know I know her very well. I um, met with her a few times. We had a rally in, um, since you're talking about 2016, we had a rally for Amy uh, in Warsaw back in 2016, actually. <laughs> And um, people were showing up. Uh, Amy was there as well with her boyfriend uh, outside the Norwegian embassy in Warsaw. Uh, the rally was successful. There were politicians from Poland supporting the uh, Amy and other people who had lost the children into public care. Um, I haven't heard for her for some years, but I'm, I'm, I know that she has not been able to Get her son back. You so, refer so, Poland, but she was American. She was American citizen, and I, um, I think she had dual citizenship. That she was American as well as Norwegian. Okay, all right. I now, have to. I'm not 100 percent sure about that, but I know that's correct that she was an American citizen. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, she was um, she was campaigning for her son for a long time, and then she disappeared. But. Uh, uh, I know that some Austrian people I know have been trying to help her for many years as well, and I know that she has not been able to. They are not uh, try to reunite her with the with the son. Okay. So I think that case, uh, sadly, the son is probably now eleven years old or something, and um, yeah, they are still separated. Now I remember as well uh, again in two thousand sixteen. There was even uh, something, a campaign that I started, I stand by Santiago and ask for people that to do posters and write I stand by Santiago and take those pictures and I was posting them and I was asking for Portuguese support but you know, um, I believe that society still does not like to believe or even mm -hmm. to think that the social services they are actually yeah. snatching children and selling them for adoption or even other things so but what i got inspired by the bodnari family a romanian family the guy who is a priest that's why he got so much support worldwide and i find amazing because it's very hard to get the the portuguese protesting in the streets and these guys they were outside when there was snow it like in the middle of october and they did get the children back. Five children. They were able to get the five, the five children back, right? The Bulnari case was amazing because they managed to mobilize worldwide. Hundreds of thousands of people were supporting them. I was in. I remember Romanian. I was in Washington. They are Romanian. That's a difference. They were Romanians, exactly. I was in Romania. I was in Washington D.C. and in, even in D.C. I met with like six thousand people protesting outside the Norwegian embassy. 
Oh, well, they, they came from all over the United States to support, and they had no like connection to the family, but they felt like a, they felt like a duty to um, to show up, and and that's what differs the Eastern European communities and the Western European that you have a massive, you have much more support in the Eastern European communities. But however, what I see is that Norway, as a rich country, has managed to pay a lot of money to these Eastern European countries. So even the support in Eastern European countries are on the decline. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so that's something that worries me a little bit, that we were able to gather thousands and thousands of people back in 2016, 2017 for these protests. But now, even after all these convictions in the European court, we see that people, it, it, to me it seems like people are a bit tired and that they're not willing to mobilize the way that they did like say eight, nine years ago. So that, that, that worries me a little bit to see that the engagement is uh, on a decline. So, and especially in, the, and that happens even in Norway, that we had the, we had demonstrations before, we don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know what happened to the, to the social engagement, but something has happened. Yeah. And the government is also paying off. And, you know, and people see that the government ignores and they don't care about the judgment from the European court. So, they, it seems like some of them basically are slowly giving up in a way. Yes, but I called attention again. These these children that they were given back to this couple, they were from, a, he was a priest, so there is a community already, but they are Romanian. And what I have seen worldwide is that the Romanian, they really stick together. So that's <coughs> one successful case. Now there is another successful case in Norway, and that's from Sagarika. And that's amazing. I have the pleasure to speak with her already in here. Uh, it's amazing because Sagarika is the one that is portrayed in the video um, Mrs. Absolutely. Chatterjee versus Norway, correct? Yeah, yeah the movie. I, I was there in India and the, on the premiere in March 2023, a year and a half ago. Amazing experience and I was so impressed with the Indian people as well. So the, those two cases you were mentioning, the Sagarika case and the Bunari case, they have something in common that they are able to to, to get support from uh, not only from their own domestic countries but also world from from other places and that that proves how the government of Norway was had to to let these children uh, be returned to their to the families. Yeah, so because India, India, uh, India government supported Sagarika, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Indian government supported Sagarika and even this was a in, I remember this case very well back in 2011 that. Because I, had, I was in contact with the government in India and also with uh, Surania, who was the, the lawyer. And uh, the, the, the foreign minister of India gave Norway like a deadline that if the children were not returned within like uh, three days or so, there would be a diplomatic, huge diplomatic crisis between India and Norway. And the same happened with Romania back in with the Bunari case that Romania was... Uh, about to throw out the Norwegian ambassador because of that case. So you see that they put a lot of, you know, public and political pressure on the country, and they worked, of course, in these cases. So that, that proves once again that in the cases where I've seen successful reunification, you also see that uh, there is some big support also from the, from the government. So, for instance, in your case, it would be nice to see if Portugal or the Portuguese government could put some pressure on the British government. Unfortunately, that will never happen because by history, Portugal is, has been submissive to England, you know. Sure. Portugal has asked for the English to come and protect us and fight the Spanish, but mm -hmm. the, the, the English, they were leaving the boats full of gold from Portugal. They were, they were uh, stealing everything around the churches. So that's a bit of history in between Portugal and, and, and England. And sadly, you live in a Western European country and that it's even more difficult to gain the necessary support. Did you ever try to bring the case to the European court? Or? Yes, so because I got a wall of silence in England and the last time that we put the things into court was a lot of money and it was only just to appeal to something like 
to ask just permission so the judge could even think just to return the baby, something just like that. So it was lots of money and um, on the, what I read on the European court was if you have not done all the procedures back in the, in the English courts, mm -hmm. if you back up your case, you can send them to the European court. So that's exactly what I did. I, I, I built my own case with Leon. We wrote the complaint and it was back saying that, you know, because we have a wall of silence, because the, 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 the court is completely fictitious, everything is, is made on, on um, hearsay, and uh, we send that. And the, a couple of, um, one month, two months later, the reply came because we have not done all the procedures back in the English court, so then they were not even going to look into the case. So you, they they argue that you didn't exhaust the domestic remedies. Exactly. That's what, and that's that's a problem that happened in the Bonario case too. That they said that uh, the Bonario, even though that was a massive case with worldwide attention, they said that they hadn't exhausted the domestic remedies there as well. So, so you see, it's a very it's a very old-fashioned system and it's a very slow system and ineffective system. But that's um, but at least they have. Uh, they have put put attention. So at least you can. I would advise you if you are still fighting for um, to to have your child back. I would advise you to apply the principles from the law and judgment, and use them um, in the English uh, judiciary, because there is always like uh, because the the thing is that. The court says that taking a child into public care is a temporary measure that should be discontinued as soon as circumstances permit. So for you, I mean, it's it's obviously that that sentence should be the the cornerstone of your yeah, league if if you were still fighting. That's, they they uh, supposedly they send him for adoption. That's what they say. You know, he was a baby with five days old, and the paperwork. Yeah. For him to be adopted was made even when he was still with me and he was mm. five days old you know mm. so all the things they were already done so like i do not know if he has really been adopted or he's still like they are making money from him in fostering i i don't i don't know i uh, you know like i don't have anyone from law backing me up i never ever never ever been contacted by anyone in portugal of human rights Never, ever. No, I think that my, my impression when I've been to Portugal and talked to these judges and uh, lawyers uh, is that uh, human rights issues is not a very is not a very interesting topic in Portugal for some reason. I don't know why, but it seems like you're right that people don't have the uh, the, the the knowledge about it. And, um, and well, am, I, am I enlightening you, Maris, if you allow me? <laughs> So yeah, after... I, I, I'm, I'm going on a world tour now. Um, I'm starting in Dublin in the end of... Um, I'm now actually starting in Warsaw because there is a human rights conference there, then going to Dublin. But I'm going to travel around and see and also be inspired by this um, Irish group to see if we can uh, somehow uh, connect better worldwide. So yeah. that's something to yeah. keep in mind. That yeah. um, if if time allows, I can yeah. fly back from. Um, I can I can run by Portugal on the way back to Europe right. after being in in South America because in South America there are and also South Korea there are lots of issues with Norway going on about this. They have uh, that Norway has been stealing uh, children from these poor countries and adopted them to Norwegian families, you know, or give them away to Norwegian families. So that's a big issue now in Norway going on that, you know, we're talking about uh, massive, it's like it's like a mother form of slave trade or something. Mm. Marius, regarding Portugal, after I made my case public, the Portuguese mothers, they were contacting me and saying, you know, Yolanda, it's not just in England, in Portugal, mm. they are doing the same to us. So what I told them is, you know, I cannot speak for yourself, but you can get the momentum and go on TV and speak about it. So actually there was a journalist in Portugal that made an investigation, let's say it like that. And what he exposed was actually that the, the most notorious judge for the family court in Portugal alleged 
was actually the guy that had, um, I believe, around seven, at least seven houses for children, for fostering children. So mm. when the, actually the journalist asked the judge, is mm. not that a conflict of interest? And the judge, <laughs> smirking, said, it's not a nasty question that you are doing. That mm -hmm. doesn't look, that doesn't, doesn't sound nice, your question. It's not, not just nasty what you are trying to imply. Trying, trying to allege him. So basically yeah. what they're saying, what they're yes. saying in here is that the, uh, at the moment the minimum salary in Portugal is 820 euros. That itself is a joke. But I can tell you that it seems that the, these houses, these associations, these fostering houses, allegedly owned by judges in Portugal, they receive per child at mm -hmm. least, allegedly, a thousand euros. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, not surprising at all. That number is actually very small. In Norway, you know, uh, a foster family can make uh, up to a hundred thousand euros per year taking care of one child. So the, the numbers are quite massive and the lawyers are eager to maintain the system because it generates money for them as well and the, the judges. So it's, it's as long as it's so much money involved. You know, a French lawyer told me some years ago that uh, French had, France has 12 times as many people as Norway. 60 million compared to 5 million and the French uh, CPS budget is like half the size of the Norwegian one even though there are 12 times as many people so it once again proves that money is a very important part of this and as well as uh, so I wouldn't be surprised that you know the people in power they know how to uh, privilege themselves and um, so um, I'm sure that a lot of things are going on in Portugal like you know, even maybe on a smaller basis in Norway but still you know so wouldn't surprise me so this is like you know, unfortunately um, like I say to Norwegian families whose children have been taken away from them too I say the same thing to them as I say to you that if you were in uh, Eastern European country for instance when your child was born this would never have happened so this is like a Western uh, European phenomenon. That's why also some Western. But I was thinking that maybe Portugal was a little better. But um, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest. Right. But let me but tell England, you as well. England is, England is, England is as almost as bad as Norway. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And, and let yeah. me tell you that the, um, unfortunately there is a case in Germany involving an Indian mother. And she didn't get no support like Sagarika. Even Sa I asked Sagarika, why do you think that India is not supporting this mother? Is it just because it's Germany and there is more money involved? And sh she couldn't yeah. respond it. I met with that family, if you're talking about the Arya case, uh, I met with that family in India. And um, I agree with you. I think it's very strange that that case for some reasons have been like... Uh, have had very little attention and they're still struggling with the German system. Um, I made an approach to the German minister and never been responded, of course, but uh, still it's uh, it's very sad to see because that's a very nice family and and there were absolutely no reasons to keep that child into, in, in, in public care and in Germany, but still it's, it's very surprising for me as well that why didn't, why is not India standing up stronger in that case? Yeah. Do you get any support from your colleagues or or actually in the other way around? Do you, do you, do you, do you get some hate, <laughs> uh, I like that question. It's like I have a lot of followers. I have like 40,000 followers on social media, but no, not one single lawyer in Norway is supporting me. No, because they're, first of all, they're afraid because if they're supporting me, they will be, uh, they're afraid that the government will dislike that, of course, and they rely, and, and most no lawyers in Norway who are working on child welfare cases, they rely upon the government, because the government is paying their salaries. So, surprisingly, not very many, uh, hardly any you know, lawyers in Norway is, uh, are, are supporting the, my campaign, uh, even though they've seen, of course, that I have been successful in the European court, but they were still, I think they're afraid that uh, support for me is like, 
an attack to their own wallets, to put it that way. So no, I have uh, I have a lot of support internationally as well as uh, nationally, but that's more for the people who who have been um, or feel offended or abused by the government somehow. So and that's fine. That's 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 the people I want me to to, to have the support from too. So I, that's exactly. Uh, my idea as well to be a voice for the people who are fighting the systems. Yeah. So, and the, the more the government dislikes what I'm doing, that's why that's why it's also very important for me to travel around because as long as I'm traveling around the world and to establish connections worldwide, yeah. that's something that the government in Norway doesn't like. No. And of course. So, um, so for me, it's like a very, I have a very open profile about that, that my voice is on the people's side. And, uh, and of course, the elite in Norway truly dislikes that. So, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm very confident with that. So that's fine. But no, we, but to be precise about the question, no lawyers are, you know, supporting my campaign at all. No. Marius, a man like you doing what you are doing for all the other families, do you have children? Do I have children? Yeah, I have two grown old daughters, they're 20 and 21. And, and I think that due to my strong international network, the government for the last 10 years, they have left me pretty much, they haven't harassed me much at all. Uh, I, they have left me alone. And I think the reason why is that. They know that if they start to harass me, they know that I will um, I will Backfire. go to the international society, and uh, and that's uh, something you know. I, I was talking with Indian politicians uh, when we had the premier on this Mr. Chatterjee versus Norway last year, and and India is still so upset with Norway that Indian politicians still want to boycott Norwegian trade, for instance, and that's something I encourage the Indian more and more. That in the in the Sagarita case, Norway has never, you know, apologized for the wrongdoings. They have never paid compensation for their human rights abuses, and they've been very arrogant towards the Indian people and the Indian government as well. So my, so when I was there, we were talking seriously about how to boycott Norwegian trade, and that's something that I will um, talk more with uh, Surani and Sagarita also about that I think that it's time, you know, to to step up and see that Norway should not be able to profit from Indian businesses mm -hmm. or to do businesses in India as long as they have this arrogant approach towards the human rights abuses. Mm -hmm. So so these things and the government in Norway is totally aware that um, we can put the finger in and, and 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 start to sabotage Norwegian trade. And that's something that um, I, I support as long as Norway has this attitude towards human rights abuses. Yeah. Have you ever heard about um, David Wynne Miller? Mm, American? No. Uh -huh. uh, American, a judge, mar maritime law, David Wynne Miller. Uh, maybe, but I cannot recall at the moment. No, okay. So he was. Um, uh, he became our friend, but obviously we're trying to use his technology and trying to mm. get our baby on that way. But unfortunately, we are dealing with child traffickers and there is mm. there is no law that they respect, nothing at all, so it was impossible. I would just like to inform you as well that uh, Leon Edwards, so Santiago's father, he was... Um, well known worldwide for supplying MMS, Master Mineral Solution, and um, I don't have nothing got to do with that because I was working in cardiology and I do not ever want it to be associated with that and actually in Portugal I've never spoken, um, the TV never actually let me even approach the, the subject matter because it's associated with um, uh, allegedly, there is children that they have been healed in uh, autism, and there is cancer, and there is all those things associated to that. That is Leon's, Leon's Edwards, uh, what he was doing, uh, using Jim Humble uh, technology, let's call it like that. And there was about malaria in Africa, there is the Red Cross, and all those things. So, mm -hmm. Um, BBC did um, uh, two um, hard pieces of defamation on Leon Edwards. I see. So, um, 
So I don't know if um, uh, my son was, I believe probably, my son was actually sent for adoption to shut him down because mm -hmm. what he was okay. doing was getting too big and he had the website and uh, someone okay. in a, in a, in a, in a um, chemotherapy and all those things, pharmacy, mm -hmm. they were not really liking what he was approaching um, in the public uh, scenario. So, so no, nothing should surprise you because uh, there is so much evilness going on anyway. So I wouldn't be surprised at all yeah. that could happen. So, yeah. so are you, do you have any legal approach now to, to, uh, to get your son back or is it like more of a campaign you are doing now? Yeah, so I have never been silenced about in uh, these eight years. I believe that the fact that by giving even voice, giving voice to other families, I'm always leaving breadcrumbs for my son. My name, Yolanda Menino, is the only one worldwide. So I believe that I, I'm sure that I'm going to find my son. I don't know how long I'm going to take and how, but I'm sure yeah. that okay. I'm going. I'm, I'm uh -huh. sure, literally. You know, I have may, uh -huh. I have been able to manifest my reality. You know, by approaching the president. You know, I vision mm -hmm. in my mind how it was going to be, and I did it. So. If you have any, if you have any uh, journalists or people from the uh, from the politics who are willing to talk about these cases, I would, I can be happy to come to see you in the in January when I'm done with my first part of the tour because now I'm starting my first part, and I have um, I have like part one and part two, and um, I'm doing mostly uh, Latin and South America this time. But uh, from January, I will um, I will do some I will some do some tours in Europe before I go to um, Asia and New Zealand. I'm gonna do I'm gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna try to organize a more solid human rights foundation in New Zealand. And um, I was there four years ago, and they are struggling exactly with the same things as they we're doing in England and, uh, and Norway. That uh, the CPS system. Uh, is you know targeting like they consider like weak families and take a lot of children into public care. So we have to strengthen that base because New Zealand feel like kind of like isolated and not very closely linked to to the rest. But if you want, and um, we can you. set up some um, some things in in January uh, because then I will be back in Europe and then uh, then we can see if we can put more focus on it also in Portugal. I I, I was. You know, I was quite on on the media, on the TV. I was able to bring quite a few Portuguese women that they were back in England, and I gave them to a journalist, and it was a huge piece in Portugal, and got lots of audience. Even the journalist got a, a, a reward by what she did, and mm -hmm. and then there was a meeting in England. Um, uh, because the, the Portuguese government had to say something to those Portuguese women and um, and nothing was done even um, no. actually let me tell you that even uh, actually Portugal did something Portugal did finance a movie mm -hmm. that got a reward in Venice and it put a woman abandoning a baby near a bin to go to a supermarket and rob mm -hmm. and did not supply any food for the children and none of that. So, and uh, the goal at the end was just to say that the baby was going for forced adoption. Obviously, no. when I saw this on the cinema and then I came public and I said to the people, this movie was financed by the Portuguese government to try to destroy what I have been doing. But the fact that the Portuguese government had to do this, I know how important I have been doing and I know that I have been doing something. Otherwise, they would not need to do such thing. I see. But anyway, um, would be would be interesting to see if we can um, if we can um, yeah, collaborate any further. Yeah. I will. I'm, I'm definitely. I'm sure that the meeting I will have with uh, the, the mothers group in uh, Dublin will also be of some interest. So we can see. Yes. But anyway, yes. I will. Um, we can yeah. keep in touch that way yeah. and um, and see if we can. Uh, yeah. 
find a find time for for a meeting in the Portugal. Yeah. Are you close to Lisbon or? I'm not close to Lisbon. I'm close to the airport. I will I will oh. I will share with you my location. Okay. Yeah. I know that Big Brother knows, but I haven't disclosed it publicly. But anyway, yeah. So we can see if we can um, arrange something um, a little later and um, get back to that. Yes. Okay, Marius. Thank you so much for your time, and it was a pleasure, Welcome. a real pleasure, and, and congratulations for the work that you are doing, because we really need um, more people like you. We need to keep it up, and that's something that is good. That I see that I gain more and more followers. That so there is some kind of like movement that more people are, you know, waking up a little bit at least. So even though we have we don't have these demonstrations anymore like we did back in the 15 and 16, you know, the Bonari case was exceptional, and I was so impressed with especially the Romanian people who they, they were able to you know mobilize the whole country. Yeah. So, so we need, we need, we need more of that. But Let me I, ask I'm you, sure we will have. Let something. me ask you one last thing. I don't know if you know in um, in England, there was in Leeds. Uh, yeah. There was a community, a Romanian I, again, burning, Romanian. burning buses and all of that. Now, yesterday I had, I was in a live meeting on TikTok, and there was quite a several men in there. And I don't know if it's because I'm a lion mother or whatever. My, my idea was, you know, we need men outside taking the Romanian exactly. example. I don't mean getting a knife, but no, yeah, that's... maybe burning buses is not a bad idea because that got attention worldwide and the children were given back to an uncle. They went, didn't go for forced adoption. So maybe there is an example in there. I remember that one. That's true. So we'll see. Hopefully we can we can be inspired by that. But anyway. Nice Thank you, to Marius. You. Thank you so much. For... And, um, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Marius. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay, bye.